Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Crouch, and this is now the legislative update uh, presented each month by Williamson, Inc., our Chamber of Commerce here in Williamson County. We are uh, thankful for our audience here at uh, Columbia State and uh, our listeners on WAKM 950 and our uh, watchers over on uh, Channel 3, WCTV. Glad to have you all with us, and uh, hope you'll... Uh, Stay with us for the full hour. I think we've got about two hours worth of material this morning, and uh, we're going to try to uh, pack as much of it into this hour as we can, and then, if possible, have a couple of questions and answers at the end if you would like to ask those. Our guests this morning uh, are Williamson County Legislative Delegation, our State Senator and the new Senate Majority Leader, Jack Johnson, our 63rd district representative and the new speaker of the house of the state uh, of Tennessee is now Glenn Castle with us this morning and our 65th district representative Sam Whitson and 61st district uh, representative Brandon Ogles uh, the newest member of our delegation glad to have you all with us this morning Mr. Speaker I'm going to start with you this morning we uh, uh, been a lot of interest over the past uh, couple of months in Representative David Byrd yes. and the uh, uh, accusations uh, that have come his way and uh, the fact that you had appointed him as chairman yes. of one of the education <laughs> subcommittees. And there have been a couple of major, I guess, announcements this week around that. Yeah. First of all, that you had agreed to meet with the accuser, yeah. and then yesterday that you had uh, removed Representative Byrd from that chairmanship. Uh, first of all, curious as to what you think you might learn from the meeting with uh, the lady that uh, has accused him. You know, my office and I meet with anyone that calls. Uh, I'm, I'm at this point about a three, three and a half week backup. But if you call my office, no matter who you represent, who you are, if you're a citizen of the state, I'm going to meet with you. Uh, and so that, that set, uh, I don't remember the date, but it's in April. It's probably three weeks from now, knowing my calendar. So I look forward to that. And then after, uh, so uh, the news that broke yesterday was I did ask uh, David Byrd to resign and, and, uh, from his chairmanship. Uh, many, many members come to me and say, Glenn, this is just a distraction. We understand it's an accusation. We understand it's 35 years old. But it's a distraction to me doing my business. And... Uh, both Republicans and Democrats came to me, and so uh, based upon that, because uh, based upon that, I asked for his resignation. What what must transpire is that the people's business must be done, and it must be done in an orderly fashion. Uh, and so anything that's a hindrance or a distraction has to be moved out of the way. And so that was my decision, and uh, David understood, and and he uh, is no longer chairman of that subcommittee. Right. Uh, other gentlemen, Brandon, have you got any? Uh color from behind the scenes on uh, the feelings in the in the house and how that uh, how that came down well I'll start by saying Glenn is nicer than I am because I do not meet with everybody that calls me uh, if you don't live in my district uh, you probably are not going to get a meeting because there are too many bills coming through the state's too big there's too many people that want to uh, uh, express opinions based on uh, what they see and if I don't have a vote and it's not coming through my committee and it's not something that I'm working on specifically I can't take 30 minutes out of my day to meet with you because I have children and a family and this is a part-time job so Glenn is working very very hard he's very open very transparent and I applaud him for doing that uh, it's been a very hard situation to deal with and I applaud Glenn for his uh, actions uh, it, it, it is hard to make decisions based on accusations. I mean, we believe in due process and people are assumed innocent until proven otherwise. So with that, um, you know, it puts him in a hard place. It puts us all in a hard place, but we take accusations like this very seriously. We definitely respect women mm -hmm. and want to lift women up in this state and uh, hold them in very, very high regard. So, um, and we'll continue to do that. And that's, that's all I have to say. Yeah. Jack in the Senate, uh, I think Lieutenant Governor McNally had called for this to happen uh, maybe earlier on, and is that the sentiment in the Senate as well? Well, uh, you should know that the, the, the Senate and the House are two independent bodies. They, they are two independent chambers, and there's kind of an unwritten rule up there that we let the House kind of take care of their business, and the Senate takes care of its business. 
Uh, last year, when uh, Speaker Harwell had, uh, had called on Representative Byrd to, to resign, uh, Lieutenant Governor McNally more or less said he, he supported the, the wishes of the Speaker. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that position was consistent with, with a new General Assembly and a new uh, and a new speaker in the House, and I think it's it's you know respect between the between the bodies. Mm -hmm. But I think we had a we had a press event yesterday right after uh, the news broke that that, that Speaker Cassidy had asked uh, Chairman Burr to to resign, and uh, and Lieutenant Governor McNally was very supportive of of Glenn's actions. Yeah. Good. Uh, I'd like to get the elephants in the room out in the open, uh, so let's just go ahead and do that. Uh, Early on, there's also been a fair amount of controversy uh, amongst our um, friends uh, over vouchers in our charter schools. And uh, the governor has come out very strongly in favor of uh, vouchers, in particular education savings accounts, we now call them. And the uh, speaker has uh, come out uh, pushing very hard for that, and you have as well. Uh, some of the other members of our delegation maybe are not quite as uh, uh, comfortable with that. But uh, tell us what the governor is trying to accomplish, how it works, and how that will affect not only the state of Tennessee, but Williams County specifically. Sure. Yeah, and we, we've talked about it previously, and, and, and Governor Lee has introduced what I think is a very good and a very bold proposal. Uh, and and. And I'm going to take a couple of minutes here, Dave, because there's there's a lot of misinformation out there about this proposal, and a lot of it is coming from school boards and school administrators, either intentionally or unintentionally, because they either have bad information or they choose not to to recognize what is really um, uh, what we're really trying to accomplish. In 2010, I was invited to watch a screening of a movie called Waiting for Superman, and if you haven't seen this movie, I encourage you to do so because it was a documentary that chronicled the lives of some families in Washington, D.C. And uh, again, about 10, 10, 15 years ago. <clears throat> and these were poor families, predominantly minority, that were zoned for really, really bad schools, failing schools. And at that time, and still today, uh, Washington, D.C. had a number of very high-performing charter schools. And the message of the documentary is, is to really show the plight of families, of some families who cannot afford to move to get their child into a better school. They certainly can't afford tuition to a private school. And so in this particular instance, their one real hope was to hopefully get their child into one of these charter schools that were having amazing results. Well, the capacity in the charter schools was, was limited. And so they didn't have room for every family who wanted to put their child in one of these schools. And so they had a lottery, and they would literally draw names out of a hat to determine who got to go into uh, these charter schools. And it shows this one family. It's a single mother and her little boy who's probably six or seven years old. And they were just desperately hoping that their name would be drawn so that he could get into this, into this charter school. And their name wasn't drawn. And it was such an emotional, compelling moment in that documentary. And I think it really reflects what some families are dealing with. And that is public education is a partnership. It's a partnership between the state and the local government, predominantly a school board. And by and large in Tennessee, we're doing very well. We're making significant improvements in uh, K-12 education. But one of the areas where we're not is specifically with poor and predominantly minority families. And, and these failing schools are largely in Shelby County, Davidson County, Knox, Chattanooga, and then Madison County, which is Jackson, Tennessee. And so we've struggled with this as a General Assembly ever since I've been up there, and it's been a struggle for decades. And so what Governor Lee did is, is he did his homework, and he did a lot of research, and he looked at some other states and some best practices and some, some things that other states were doing. And he saw where, um, when charter schools are utilized in some of these underperforming areas, and you give parents choice via a voucher or an ESA, an educational savings account, to do something different with their kids, it moves the needle significantly. Governor Lee is, is pretty good friends with Jeb Bush, the former governor of Florida. Uh, Jeb Bush was elected in 1998. And he ran on a platform of education reform, including education choice 
and, expand, and expansion of charter schools. The state of Florida went from 40th in the nation for fourth grade reading uh, among poor and minority students to first in the nation. First, 40th to first. You cannot argue with the results, ladies and gentlemen. They work. Education choice works when it's targeted at specific demographics. So Governor Lee has proposed two things, one of which is a charter authorizer, which would allow, which we already have, by the way, it's just now done through the State Board of Education. And he wants to create an independent board that will hear charter application appeals. The process now is, if someone wants to, a, a charter operator, and these are public charter schools, not private charters, if a charter applicant wants to open a charter school in Shelby County, they must go to the Shelby County School Board and apply. And then the Shelby County School Board can determine whether or not they want to authorize this charter to come into that system or not. Same thing in Davidson County and in, in every other county. It's the same thing, that, that's the way it is right now in Williamson County. A charter applicant can come to the Williamson County School Board and apply for a charter uh, uh, ap application. If the local board denies that application then, currently under current law it goes to the state board and the state board can overturn that, that decision. We're not really changing that process, but we are gonna create an independent charter review board that will be solely authorized to review these uh, appeals on application. And this board can overturn the decision of the local government. Because what we find is the school systems where the charters are most needed are the ones most likely to deny the charter application. And that's why we have that process. <coughs> now, on ESAs. An ESA, an educational savings account, would say that if your child attends a school in a district that has three or more failing schools, and again, that's five school systems right now in the state of Tennessee, and I told you which ones those are then you will be eligible for an education savings account for your child. That savings account will be funded with the BEP formula allocation that is allocated to your child. In Shelby County, that's about $12,000. Davidson County, it's about $11,000. That money will go into an educational savings account that the parent can then use for private school, tuition, after school programs, whatever they think they need to best get the, edu the, get the best education they can for a child. Here's what's unique, though. In Governor Lee's proposal, if that BEP money follows the child and goes into the education savings account, Governor Lee's going to replace the money for the school district. So if you live in Shelby County and your child leaves the Shelby County school system to go to a private school, and so the BEP money follows, Bill Lee's going to make that school system whole for three years. We're going to call it a transition period. So the school loses the child, doesn't have to provide a teacher, a desk, books, anything else for that child, but they get to keep the money for three years. One of the biggest arguments I hear from people opposed to vouchers or education savings accounts is, you're taking money away from, from public schools. No, we're not. They're getting more money on a per capita basis because they're keeping the money. If, if 100 kids leave that school system, they're going to get all that money put back in for three years. So don't give me an argument that this is taking money away from public schools, because it's not. Furthermore, <coughs> excuse me, I'm over the cold now, but it's still, it's still residual in there a little bit. Um, for these five school systems, which have those high concentration of failing schools, if you look at the numbers in Florida, it moves the needle. It moves the needle significantly. We've heard us talk about Tennessee as one of the fastest improving states in the nation, according to the National Assessment of Education Progress, and we are. We've made significant strides, but guess where that improvement is not happening? It's not happening with poor minority students in these inner city schools. So opponents of this say, I don't like vouchers. I don't want to do vouchers. Vouchers are bad for public education. What about the kid? I'm concerned about the kid, the child that is trapped in a failing school. His parents don't have the opportunity to improve that child's life and give them a, a chance at pursuing the American dream. So when I hear a school board in Williamson County passes a resolution opposing this initiative, do you understand the optics of that? 
We're the wealthiest, whitest county in the state. And we're saying we don't want to do something to help inner city kids who are poor and predominantly minority. Shame on you. Shame on you. This is a good proposal. It's a bold proposal. And let me add as well, Governor Lee's budget includes more new money for public education than any budget in the history of the state of Tennessee. 175 million new dollars, including 71 million dollars for teacher pay raises for public school teachers. 25 million per year, the ESA program will start in 2021. 25 million a year to go into the ESA program to replace the money in these failing schools when kids leave to go to a private school. $40 million for educational, saving, uh, for educational safety to help, which Brandon has been a leader on. I can't tell you how committed this governor is, not only to public education, but when our partnership between state and local government is failing those kids, it's not only our right to do something, it is our obligation. And if getting those kids out of those failing schools and into a private school will help them have an opportunity to go to college instead of going to prison, we should do it. We should absolutely do it. So I've said repeatedly, Williamson County has no failing schools, much less three. So this doesn't affect Williamson County or Franklin Special. I've been criticized for saying, oh, I support vouchers as long as it doesn't affect Williamson County. That's not what I said. Williamson County doesn't have the need. We've got great public schools. But there are areas of our state where we don't, and these kids are trapped, and we should do something to help them. So I'm the proud, enthusiastic sponsor of this legislation. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure it passes. So uh, anybody had any doubt about how Jackson did on this issue? Uh, just watch the reruns of this show. J and, Jack uh, is a bashful guy. I've been trying to get him to come out of that shell for years. But, uh, yeah, Mr. Speaker, you've uh, been working... <laughs> You've been working really hard on this bill as well. Did Jack miss, miss anything? No, uh, no. He, he said it very well, very passionately. I just, for eight years under Governor Haslam, we've, we've, we've spent $1.3 billion, that's with a B, new dollars to public education. And it's raised the ship in a lot of school districts, but in the failing districts, it's not. And so Einstein defined uh, lunacy as doing the same thing over and over. So let's quit just giving unlimited amount of money to the failing schools, let's try something different. And this idea catches my attention. Let's take the kids out of the schools. Maybe the problem is the school, uh, and it could be administrator, it could be environment, I don't know. But let's take those, failing, those kids in failing schools, let's take them out and give them a relief raft, a vehicle to go to another school. And so we'll, we'll try this several years, and if this doesn't work, we'll try something else. But if you look at Florida and other states, uh, the, this uh, educational savings account has proven to be very effective. So let's try it and see what happens. One, one question that uh, I think is a fair question that the critics have uh, raised is that they're afraid that the courts will come in and say, you've offered school choice in Nashville, you've offered it in Memphis, Jackson, Knoxville, Chattanooga, but my child wants school choice in Williamson County. Uh, and that the courts will come in and decide that, you know, we not only should have school choice in the failing districts, but in the other districts as well. Uh, are there any constitutional concerns about that? Are there any legal concerns about that? The ESAs have been around for several years, and it hasn't happened to date. So logic would dictate that if no other state's been sued, Tennessee wouldn't be either. But more importantly in foundation, when you make public policy, uh, you can, we're the legislative branch of government. You can't worry about what if, what could, what might happen. You can't worry about that. That's another branch of government. Uh, but based on what's not happened in the past and, and trying to do something to help these kids, I, I think we're very constitutionally sound. Okay. Sam? I'm Brandon? sorry, I don't have a microphone. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we can fix and that. it didn't come through my committee. <laughs> so, um, well, listen, um, I, I know where our, my senator and my speaker stand on this, and, I, and, and even though we may differ, I want to tell you I firmly believe they are committed to our public schools and our public education. But I have a fundamental difference on the vouchers, okay? And, and it's based on my campaign that I started three years ago as a strong supporter of public education. And I'm not saying they're not 
in any way at all. And I firmly believe if a voucher ever hit Williamson County, they'll be the first two to fight that tooth and nail in Williamson County. But unless Williamson County has failing schools. And that ain't going to happen. If we have failing <laughs> schools in Williamson County, then right. we, would, we would support it here. So um, my issue comes down basically to um, uh, uh, an issue that what the unintended consequences, what kind of schools could we see opening in these uh, districts that are we ready for, say, a Branch Davidian school and what they promote? and then the courts force us to, to send taxpayers' dollars to those schools. It will be out of our hands. And I, as a taxpayer, I have a fundamental problem with that, and I've always have, and that's where I stand on this issue. Brandon? There's, there's still work going on on the uh, bill itself. There's, there's been some amendments, there's been some negotiations, some changes. Uh, I see it continually getting more palatable um, for where I'm at. I, I, was, I ran and loved my public schools. Uh, I'm a product of public education. And first and foremost, I always want to see public money going to public education. However, there is some data and there are some extremely failing districts that we need to look at. We need to strengthen up. And from a financial standpoint and what I'm looking at on budget sub and full, uh, to some degree, that's good money chasing bad. We've thrown a lot of money at those districts. We keep throwing money at those districts, and those schools are not improving. So regardless of where you're at on public, private, and how that money's distributed or what your preference is, those schools need to be fixed. Those districts need options, and it's, it's, we can't keep kicking the ball down the road. Uh, it's time to do something. I do trust my governor. I do trust my speaker. I do trust my leader, and they've been doing this. Uh, well, these guys have. We've got a new governor. He's a he's a freshman as well as I am. I would say, uh, but I, I've talked to the governor um, several times. I was uh, uh, last night. I was actually over there, and uh, I had a meeting yesterday with uh, Dr. White, uh, chairman of uh, education. Uh, I will not be administratively killing any bill based on my preference and budget sub, because in that regard and where I'm at there, I'm looking at the financial ramifications of what that bill does. And when it has a funding letter from the governor, um, and it, you know, unless I see some strong evidence in the next couple of weeks before it comes to my committee that it is intentionally uh, harming public education, um, I most likely will let that go through and hit the floor because uh, education has spoke, the, uh, the members have spoke, and uh, I think it needs to be debated and hit the floor at this point. So unless I see some uh, very strong data, some very, unless it's amended and changed in a negative way, but the governor has been extremely gracious on funding public education. And, it, it, and you know, specifically to the policy I've been working on, uh, he, he's committed, a, it's going to be a half a billion dollars over the next decade for school safety. It's $50 million a year with a local match for public uh, safety. And that's something that a year ago, we didn't even know that we'd have $10 million in the budget next year. So, you know, he, he's taking str great strides to put our children first. And I trust that he's trying to do that. The policy behind that, the, the debate, we'll always have debates and won't agree on issues. But I, I, believe the, I believe his heart is in the right place. I believe he wants to help these children. And um, I look forward to, to seeing how this plays out. And I want to see those schools improve. The, uh, for anyone that really wants to uh, see how this experiment has played out over a long period of time, you could look uh, at the New Orleans public schools that are no longer run by the public. They're all run now by charter schools. and. Uh, see how that played out it in effect it did away with the public schools in the failing school district but uh, I think the results are positive for the kids so you've got a you know you've got pros and cons there but uh, just uh, appreciate your color on that your uh, background and we will stay tuned and listen to uh, how the debate continues the chamber board uh, voted recently to uh, uh, support 
uh, five bills that are, uh, I think, either going through or have gone through the, uh, the legislative process here recently. Uh, notably, the historic tax credit, which uh, Tennessee, uh, I think, is one of the few states in the South here that has not had one. Um, now, Sam, I think you've been pretty heavily involved in the tax credit uh, debate. Uh, yes, and my that? understanding, that legislation faces a, a, a large fiscal note, so it's uh, we'll have to come up with the funds that we can support the tax credit for preserving these our historical buildings. I believe Kevin Vaughn out of Bartlett is carrying that legislation. Uh, there's probably no one better qualified to carry that than Kevin, but. Uh, been talking to the local preservation community about that, and but we do understand there is a fiscal note to that, and we'll have to come up with the funds to cover it. We we met uh, Monday with all the parties, uh, with the governor's folks. On uh, looks like they've got to, we've got the, the the request down to about 15 million. Uh, we're looking to fund it. Uh, it's important to uh, us in the house. It's important to the leader. Uh, it's important to the governor. So we we support. It. We just got to figure out how to make it work, and we're we're working on that. The um, HOV enforcement, uh, I, I didn't hear the debate in the chamber board meeting. I'd like to have heard that, so because uh, I don't like HOV lines personally, but uh, <laughs> 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 but, uh, but the chamber is supporting the uh, the more uh, vigorous enforcement of those HOV lines, so that uh, transit and uh, high occupancy vehicles uh, can have an advantage uh, getting back and forth in traffic. Where does that bill stand? Where, where does that effort stand? Uh, I've got that bill. Uh, we're going to roll that to the second part of the 111th. It, it still needs some work, and it's going to take some work over the summer to be sure we uh, get everything right with that. Sometimes when uh, kind of keep your powder dry, uh, we need to be sure this is right before we go and start lobbying and pushing something. Uh, to be sure we have the right support, uh, specifically in transportation, and uh, so we're we're still working on it. It's it's coming. You'll see some you'll see some action on that soon. But uh, we we rolled that for now. Right. Uh, when you say you roll something, explain what that means. Oh. Well, <laughs> there's multiple. <laughs> you can roll heads, uh, which is not good. You can uh, amend your own bill, eleventh uh, hour, and have unintended consequences and do bad things, which I found out this week. Uh, basically, that that you're picking it up and you're not going to run it this session. Uh, you're going to work on it the second part of the, yeah. That, that's, how, that's the term I'm using. Right. I would like to say we addressed this uh, in the last General Assembly. And what we found out, there is serious concern for the safety of the troopers that have to pull people over during rush hour. A lot of places, there's not a place to safely pull over a car. And then what you do, you create a bottleneck. Uh, it does impact federal funding, the enforcement rate, and such. So there is a very complicated bill. And uh, it's just not a simple answer of enforcing the HOV lane. You know, right now, the uh, $10 fine is in no way worth the risk of, in fact, there, there should be zero enforcement right now because that officer in no way should put himself or the occupant of that vehicle in risk for $10. But there should be 100% compliance, so. Okay. <laughs> Jack? It, it, oh. I would just like to say a quick story. One of my buddies, he put his state license plate, house plate on, and he put his house number on there, and he drove in the HOV lane one morning. Guess what? He got about three calls. Uh, <laughs> what do you mean? No, no. <laughs> Other county. All right. I don't have house tax. Con convenient voting centers in Williamson County, the effort to uh, uh, make it possible for you to vote at any, I guess, any precinct in the county if you are registered in the county. Uh, yeah, that, that came to us from the, our county uh, election commission. We did a pilot in Rutherford County uh, last election and uh, was, was quite successful. People were watching to see how that worked. And now, uh, I, so I filed a bill, of, one of you guys have it on the House side, but we filed a bill to, uh, at the request of our county election commission to uh, uh, enable Williams County to do convenience voting. Um, as it turns out, there are a number of counties that want to do it. And so I think we're going to utilize, I, I think Shane Reeves may have a bill that, that, will, uh, that will not only make it permanent in Rutherford County, but will add in some other counties that, that, that want to give it a try. And basically it just means, as you said, much like at early voting, uh, you can go vote anywhere that early voting is available. You'd be able to do the same thing on Election Day. And so I think with the technology we have now, 
to be able to monitor who's voted and who hasn't, that the, you know, we're, we're able to do that, and we'll make it easier for people to vote on Election Day. So I would not be able to just go from precinct to precinct to precinct and vote multiple times? You could. You'd go to prison. <laughs> <laughs> so, prison to prison. Just wanted to be sure. Uh, Williams County looks like going to get a new judicial district. Um, is that uh, Sam's giving me the the? Uh, well, we, can, we got a new judge, but I'll defer to the yeah. uh, leader in the Senate on this one. Yeah, I don't know why I would have any special interest in the judges in, in this area, <laughs> but. Uh, no, we did. Last year, we were able to get a fifth judge, and it's something we've needed. And long, for full disclosure, my wife is one of our circuit court judges, but this has been going on long before she became a judge. Uh, when the 21st Judicial District was created uh, back in the 80s, it was four small rural counties. Williamson, Lewis, Hickman, and Perry counties made up that judicial district. Well, now it's three small rural counties in Williamson County. And so the caseload is, has obviously gone up exponentially in Williamson County. And uh, so working with our colleagues that represent the, the, what we refer to them as the three western counties, um, uh, the, they don't feel like they're getting, you know, appropriate treatment because you've got four Williams County judges. They don't think anyone from their area could ever get elected because Williamson County's got all the votes. And so we lobbied very hard to get a fifth judge, and we tried to make it so that that fifth judge had to come from those three counties. And that's what they want there is to have a judge that will represent those three smaller counties. And then the four judges we have now will focus on Williamson County. <coughs> and uh, so we got the fifth judge, but we're running into some constitutional issues relative to a residency requirement and, uh, and, and trying to make sure Governor Haslam appointed a gentleman named Mike Spitzer, uh, who is from Lewis County, from Hohenwald. And he is now that fifth judge. And he is servicing those three counties. And then the other four judges are serving Williamson. The problem is we have an election. He's got to run for, for the seat next year. And, uh, and we're in a strange situation is we don't want anyone from Williamson County to run for and get elected to that seat. We want to keep it someone from those, those western counties. So there is discussion about making that fifth division uh, its own judicial district. Uh, and those conversations are ongoing. It's not a done deal that we will get that, that, that new judicial district but we are working on that. There's fiscal implications because they would have their own district attorney, they'd have their own public defender, and so there's a lot of consequences, you know, things we have to think through, but that's, that's kind of where we are on that. Gotcha. That uh, explains that. And uh, there, uh, I think, Jack, you're um, or developing a bill for local education capital funding for <coughs> high growth districts like Williamson County that are having to build a lot of schools. Uh, tell us about that and where, where we are. Yeah, that's, that's an ongoing effort and uh, something that, that our dear friend, uh, the late Charles Sargent, was very passionate about. And we've worked on the last several years, uh, and we continue to work on that. Uh, Williamson County does not get a, a fair shake relative to the BEP. Uh, there's no uh, factor in that formula for growth, for high growth, and uh, so we're working on it. Like historic tax credit. Uh, I don't think there's any objection to doing it, but it's got a sizable fiscal impact because it's not just Williamson County. There are a number of districts across the state that would qualify for this additional funding. We wouldn't do it through the BEP. We'd create a, a separate funding mechanism that would uh, appropriate money based on, on, on growth and make it for capital projects and things like that to build schools, basically. So um, I, I, we're, we're working on it. But again, we've got a brand new governor. We've got a lot of things going on. We've got a lo lot of new House members. Uh, I'm hoping we can get something done this year. We've got to get to that final budget process and see where the money is and see if we can get some money appropriated. Uh, I'm, ho I'm, I'm hopeful, but I'm not optimistic it will happen this year. Uh, if it doesn't, then we'll certainly come back next year and it'll be our top priority. Hey, Dave, I want to point out something, and I hope you all realize or, or it's dawning on you that when we talk about Tennessee and legislation, the General Assembly, the, the key role that these three play, if it has to do with legislation, gov not only the governor's agenda, but the, the point of center on all legislation, being the Senate Majority Leader, Jack's hand is on it. He is he's directing that. Uh, if you notice when we talk about transportation issues, Sam's one of our chairmen of that committee, transportation issues goes through his purview. And then we've... Brandon is now on budget sub, and uh, and so he will and he will be and is one of the leaders when it comes to finances and the budget because everything in the state that has to do with finances goes through 
the subcommittee, which is the key component of finances through Brandon and Brandon's purview. So, so we're well positioned to uh, not only help Williamson County, but to prosper the state. And the state is prospering very well. If you look at us, what we're doing economically in the fields of economics and job creation, growth of income, cost of living low, taxes low, the state of Tennessee is one of the tops in the nation. And so I'm proud, these three here are the driving engineers on that issue. We're proud of our delegation. We appreciate all you're doing um, in, in all areas that, uh, that, that we want you to help us with. Uh, Katie Beckettville, uh, Sam, you seem to be a little more familiar with that. Or the rest of you, maybe I've talked to Sam a little bit about it. But, uh, well, I, I tell you, this, uh, um, the Katie Beckettville is named after a young lady back in the early 80s. Uh, she was born, and uh, she, right after birth, she developed a severe brain infection. And so her parents uh, had to have her hospitalized, and uh, they exhausted all their funds. But as long as she was in an institution or a hospital, Medicaid would cover the cost of her care. And after three years of being in an institution, uh, they, she was able to go home with uh, and she still needed a lot of uh, therapy and uh, help with feeding and uh, breathing treatments and such. But they found out if they took her home, regardless of their income, they would lose their Medicaid coverage. And so it was the governor, government was forcing them to keep their child in an institution because of their income level, which it would be cheaper to, for her to receive the same services at home. So President Reagan got involved in 1981 as part of his Medicaid Reform Act, and he came up with a program where if a child, and we're talking about the most complex medical issues, severe disabilities, we're not talking about someone, say, like my granddaughter with Down syndrome, we're talking about the round-the-clock care. These children, if they can be served at home at a cheaper cost, regardless of the family income, they can receive Medicaid coverage. Right now in the state of Tennessee, to receive this coverage, you have to meet a lower income threshold and you receive this coverage. But if you exceed the uh, income threshold, that coverage is cut off. So you're talking about a family that's making maybe $120,000, $130,000 a year. They are being faced with a $200,000 a year Medicaid uh, cost, and they're told to either get a divorce, give up custody of your child, or quit your job, and you will get this care. And I tell you what, the speaker has stood up and said, we are going make this happen. And I've received widespread support from the Senate and from the House on this. Uh, it's made it through subcommittee, through full committee, uh, and then we're going to tackle it uh, in budget next. Um, we've talked to the governor's staff, and, and it's amazing the bipartisan support on this. And so I've been blessed to carry this by the Disability Coalition. We. It, I call it coalition warfare because we got DIDS, the Department of Intellectual and Disabil uh, Developmental Disability, uh, on board with TenCare and the various agencies across the state to help push this. And if you want to see an emotional video, go back and watch the ending of each of the subcommittee and the full committee where we carry this in TenCare sub and insurance. And uh, it will break your heart, but also it will give you hope for these families out there across our state. So, uh, well, still got a fight to go, but I feel that with the bipartisan support and the support from our leadership, uh, we're going to do something great for the families of Tennessee with those children with the most complex, serious medical conditions. Let me add on to that. So, so the, the cost of this to the state, to us, to the taxpayers is $50 million. I think it's something we should do. But that's what we wrestle with every day is an, a good idea comes down and it has a, a cost of $50 million. And so you, you debate, okay, do, what do we cut or what taxes do we raise? Uh, and so that is the debate that we have is how do we come up with that kind of money and, and, and where does it come from and who pays for it because we have a balanced budget. And so because we have a balanced budget, we have very low taxes in the state, and we have a very low cost of living. Unlike Washington, D.C., which is about to run the country off on a cliff, uh, the state is run very well. And so that's what we have to wrestle with every day. And, uh, and Sam and Jack, and I know Brandon's involved too, we're proud to be leading that fight. Because there's certain people that just can't take care of themselves. I have no problem spending the money for, for those. Jack, uh, how does that work in the Senate? Uh, exact same posture. It came out of committee the uh, the other day, uh, unanimously, bipartisan, unanimously. It did, but then it goes to the finance committee. So it's one of these issues. It's you know, there's there's no debate that that we need to do it. 
that the, the issue is we have to sit down just like families and businesses do, and we've got all these priorities. We have, you know, we have this much money, and we have this many needs, and so we have to, to sift through those. But I'm, I, I agree with Sam. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic uh, that we can do, do something on this, and uh, you know, people shouldn't be uh, given an incentive to get a divorce. You know, which is one of the families testified. It was a family, and you know, they had exhausted all of their their resources, and literally, they could get a divorce. This this husband and wife could get a divorce, and then they would qualify, and they could get the in-home care, or they could institutionalize their child. And we shouldn't be putting families in that situation. Very good. The uh, the governor outlined uh, a few other pr priorities that uh, I'd like to get through in the next uh, five or t minutes or so, if we can. So I guess we can call this the lightning round. But, uh, and then there are numerous other <coughs> bills that I know Sam and Brandon and uh, all their colleagues are, are working on that are not necessarily on the governor's list that uh, he has prioritized. But let's talk about the vocational training. Uh, Jack, like there, he's asking for $25 million for additional vocational training. He's a big believer in that, of course, with his background. Uh, they have to have a lot of uh, people in, in their company that are uh, vocationally trained. Uh, what, what's he specifically trying to do and, and how does that look? Uh, I'm, I'm so excited about this because uh, it's something the governor campaigned on and he has tremendous support in the General Assembly for this. And it, what it is, it's a recognition that not every child in Tennessee needs to go to a four-year college to get a bachelor's degree. Uh, not every child needs to get a master's degree or a PhD. There are many very good paying jobs, important jobs, life fulfilling jobs that you can get with a wonderful two year degree at Columbia State, right here, community college. Um, there are technical certificates that you can get. Uh, you can become an EMT, you can become a pipe fitter or a welder or a medical transcriptionist. There are all kinds of jobs. We call them career technical education uh, type courses. Currently in Tennessee, you, in high school, uh, where there is dual enrollment available, you can take two college level courses while you're in high school uh, that will apply for college credit. Uh, most of those are taken by people who plan to go to a four year university. So they take English or they take math, they take you know, classes that will apply towards their general education credits. A very, very small percentage of those take more career technical type courses. That's what Governor Lee wants to focus on, is to make some of that training available so that, that the, the real objective here is for those kids who determine and their parents determine their, their, their path in life is probably not meant to go to a four-year university, uh, is to make them workforce ready within one year of graduating from high school so that they can come out. We've talked about the Megatronics program at Fairview. It's a great example of that. Uh, but So we're going to expand these dual enrollment uh, courses to make them available. The $25 million is to uh, increase dual enrollment opportunities across the state for more schools to partner, as we do here in Williamson County with Columbia State, to partner with some of these advanced placement type courses. So it's really exciting. It ties right in with Governor Haslam's Drive to 55, which is to recognize that 55% of all jobs in America are going to require some type of post-secondary educational attainment. And we're only at about 37, 38% of Tennesseans that have that. So to be competitive in the world and in the nation, we need more kids. Many go to four-year college, and that's great. We celebrate that. Many kids do want to go on and get a four-year degree. But for those that don't, let's give them the skills that they need and the tools that they need to be able to go out and be productive in the workforce. And that's what it's all about. Criminal justice reform. Uh, the, uh, there's, uh, I think... <coughs> two or three or four pieces to that, uh, to his efforts there in criminal justice, uh, primarily to uh, decrease recidivism. I think that's the way you say that word. And uh, uh, in trying to get the people that are incarcerated back into, the, um, into our system uh, and get, get them out there successfully. What, uh, specifically, what's he trying to do? Uh, Brandon, are you... Yes, I'm on that full committee and criminal justice uh, sub as well. And uh, recidivism, uh, I, that's the like, uh, word of the year, I will say, because uh, a year ago I had no idea what that meant. And I hear it at least probably 23 times a day now. Uh, everybody's talking about it. Uh, the most compelling data to that uh, is the, the fact that when you send a nonviolent offender to jail, 
the longer he sits in jail, the more violent he becomes. So you go, you go to jail for not paying, uh, moving violations, uh, driving without a license, uh, you, uh, you stole a $20, uh, I was gonna say CD, I don't even know if CDs are still in existence. Uh, okay, well, whatever. Uh, you, you know, so, some petty, uh, not, not minor, but some violation of the law, you go to jail. The longer you sit there, the more likely you are to come out and hurt somebody. And that, th those numbers around that, to me, were staggering. And that's where I turned on a dime. Because when I first started hearing this and saw this, I was not, uh, uh, not very compassionate in the fact that I thought we were letting bad people out of jail. And I'm a little grumpy about that. Because I want bad people to stay in jail uh, and not come out and hurt people. But that's not what we're doing. We're letting, uh, we're, we're, we're putting mechanisms in place, uh, especially around drug uh, issues and opioids and addiction issues to get people treatment, get them out of the system sooner, uh, put mechanisms in place where they don't get incarcerated, uh, get them back into society, get, give them mechanisms to have a job, be productive, have good skill training, and keep them out of those institutions because institutionalizing people and keeping them locked away for nonviolent uh, non crimes uh, is not uh, contributing to society in any way, and it is a huge drain on the financial resources of the state. Uh, so if we can get them out uh, and monitor them, get them into work programs uh, financially and for the long, uh, the well-being of the community, uh, the data is compelling that this is a, a, a great movement uh, and we'll, we're going we're gonna to aggressively go down this path. How much is that uh, effort going to cost, the fiscal note? A lot. It's expensive uh, in the short term. Uh, long term, financially, it is, uh, it is extremely, uh, I think the numbers are incarceration number per day. Monitoring is about $4 versus keeping them locked up is uh, $71 to $79, I believe. Uh, and those are, I'm sorry, we've got lots of numbers churning the last couple of days. Uh, but the number is staggering. Uh, if we can get them out, especially if they're working, especially if they're working, paying taxes, contributing back into the system rather than just purely being a burden. Just to put all these numbers in perspective, uh, the budget grows a little bit each year just because of our economic growth and uh, the health of our economy here in Tennessee. How much more this year is there to, to spend? How much more tax money is there to spend than there was last year? Does anybody know that number? Well, we're just shy of thirty-eight billion uh, total budget. Yeah. So, so the way our budget process—I'll I'll try to make this quick. Um, so, the way our process works is—is is we do a budget forecast, our revenue forecast, and that's what we base our budget on. So, we have a funding board that's made up of economists, the governor, constitutional officers, and so forth. So, they make a prediction as to how much they think our revenue will grow. We get eighty-five percent of our revenue from sales tax and franchise and excise tax the other 15% from other, other sources of revenue. So they make a prediction. The prediction that we're basing the current budget on is a growth rate of 3.1%. Okay, that's what the projected growth in revenue is for the coming fiscal year. Now, we may grow at 4%, in which case we're going to end the year with a surplus, right? That's a good thing. But if the economy has a hiccup or we, we come in at 25 then we come in below forecast. So we have to massage those numbers. But when it really comes down to it, and when we talk about some of these, these funding things, you say a $38 billion budget, oh my goodness, that's, that's so much money. Well, all but about maybe two or three hundred million of that is pretty well committed. I mean, that's 10 care, K-12 education, corrections, all these big ticket items, roads, you know, we got a dedicated road fund that, 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 that we only use for roads. So bottom line, the, the growth is probably about 300 million, okay? And we are over collecting for the current fiscal year. We'll book that as a one-time contribution in, in terms of one-time money. If you hear us talk about recurring dollars, non-recurring dollars, that goes into non-recurring dollars. And then we take that new base and we make a projection for the, for the coming year. Does that make sense? So that's, that's how we do it. We're very conservative in that process where states get themselves in trouble is they do a, oh, we're going to grow up 4.5% next year. And so they base their budget on that. And then they come in at three and they're in a world of hurt, and they end up in a deficit situation. We do not do that in Tennessee. And, 
and unfortunately, if we miss that pro a projection a little bit, that little bit is not a little bit. That little bit's more in the tune of about $100 million. Uh, so we talk about these good programmings and what they cost. So if that projection's not on, and what you're seeing, if you look to Nashville right now, you're noticing a lot of the cranes are coming down. Hmm. Uh, and there is a projection that about 2022, we're going to hit a little plateau. Uh, a lot of the forecasting folks and the big developers are saying uh, they're having whispers of uh, pullback. So we're bracing. We had a major contribution into the rainy day fund. Uh, State of Tennessee is bracing for pullback uh, because we are uh, we don't want to overcommit ourselves and get in a situation where we're, we're slashing programming uh, that we've committed to pay for. And, and I want to echo that. So yes, Governor Lee has proposed, I guess, um, I can't remember the amount, hundred and something million dollar contribution to the rainy day fund. That's one time money to get it to $1.1 billion. That's the highest our rainy day fund. That's our savings account. So if we do come in under projections by a bit and we're a hundred million off or 200 million off, we can use that rainy day fund to, to make up the difference and then correct moving forward. So that puts us in the best fiscal shape we've ever been in as a state. Yes, but it is it, it will be uh, very irresponsible to not hit projections during a good growth period, and we are in that now. So we, we're bracing. And, I, you know, first day I walked in there, I saw that big surplus, and I saw the projections, and I, I knew there was good programming out there, and I was, I, you know, at, at first look, you see that big surplus, and you want to grab that pretty quick. I mean, uh, Katie Beckett, for instance, uh, I may hit that uh, right immediately, but long term for the good of the state, for our teachers, for our schools, for security for our schools, we have to be very measured. Yep. Judge Sharon Guffey is with us this morning, or she was. <coughs> Anderson Cooper. Uh, the what we're talking about with criminal justice and incarcerating kids and that sort of thing. I know you see both sides of the story every day. Uh, and uh, is there any way you can give us a personal opinion uh, about how that, how we balance that uh, in our system? Well, the juvenile system is much different from the adult system. We're not a punitive system. However, the, the philosophies with the Juvenile Justice Reform Act that was passed last year is the same in that if you provide up front the services and treatment that children need, that hopefully that will prevent them from coming into the system. The whole objective now is to keep children from even coming to court and seeing a judge and rather providing services up front through your staff um, to do that, which is why the mid-sized counties are struggling a little bit because that costs a lot of money. Um, but hopefully the benefit is, is going to be good. Uh, you may have heard there's a little uptick in juvenile crime that's got some folks a little nervous. And we're just not quite sure how this is going to play out with JJ reform. There's a time and place to keep children detained in order to protect the public. So it's a, it's a pretty tricky balancing act. Um, I guess one of the, the, the questions that I have in terms of adult criminal justice reform is, are we talking about programs in all of our prisons or just state-run prisons or, I mean, is it the private prisons as well? Because that, that has been challenging to provide those rehabilitative efforts in private prisons. Gentlemen, response? The, the consensus is that expanding programming through, throughout the whole system would be the best option. Uh, however, it's back to the fiscal note and what we can afford and how they allocate the funding. Uh, there is a, um, how do I say this? There's a bit of pushback and uh, allocating uh, a whole lot of funding towards the criminal justice system when we still have challenges 
within our education system with children. So not that we always weigh and balance, but when you are allocating funding, you do have to pick and choose and prioritize where that money goes. Okay. Time for one more. Mindy, you're always good for a question. Mindy Tate, the Franklin tomorrow. Thank you. Um, Brandon, you just mentioned that the looks like the cranes are coming down some in, in Nashville, but what, Nashville and Williamson County have experienced tremendous growth and job growth over the last few years, and it's been a boon to our economy. Those jobs mean people, and those people need places to live. Um, a few years ago, the legislature took away one of the tools that was looking at uh, inclusionary zoning, which would allow or have built tools in given local government the chance to require types of housing in their develop, new developments. It's a tool. It, are there other tools that we can look to to provide housing, not just for the new people coming to our community, but the people that are living here and want to move up, want to change their circumstance? Uh, when we have tools that we can use that are taken away, how can we deal with the growth here, the issues of homelessness, and trying to break the cycle of poverty and get people out of a public situation and moving up? Well, we know for a fact that the most expensive places to live in this nation is where there is the tightest government controls on mandates on housing, be it, be it rent controls, be it mandatory zoning. So you, know, you look at New York City, San Francisco, Honolulu, by far the most expensive places have strict control over the market, the free market, and that drives up the cost of housing. So the state, uh, realizing what drives up the cost, we said, now locals, you can't do something that drives up the very thing you're trying to defend. So what drives up the cost of housing is the, the, the cost of the lot uh, development. Uh, the thing that we enjoy in this county so much is the strict planning and zoning codes on us because it, 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 it allows our housing to go up so much. But if you wanted to, uh, to, to get affordable housing, you greatly, greatly increase the density and take away the mandates uh, on, on the free market that says you've got to do X, Y, and Z before you can build. That is the simplest and most direct way to get affordable housing. Uh, there's a reason why housing is so much cheaper in a county that has very little zoning and planning. Um, but most Williamson Countyans like that strict. They don't want a trailer beside their 5,000 square foot home. So it's, it's give and take, and it, it deserves an honest discussion. I appreciate your leadership on that, Mindy, and you leading that discussion on where is the balance. And, and knowing you and knowing you yes. well and knowing the condition yes. of your heart, I trust where you're at. Uh, however, this is, a, this is the field that I work in, and I, I work for developers, and I understand the business very, very well. Uh, to some degree, affordable housing is not affordable housing. It's nothing more than a marketing and branding ploy to bust your density uh, restrictions wide open. And you start with that, you lead with that, you sell that, you say we need housing for teachers, first responders, the poorest in our community, and then you build flats that are $500 a square foot uh, once those are approved. So it starts off as being affordable housing. What it turns into is high density, more growth, more traffic, and more return for investors and contractors who put projects together. So I'm a little... Um, I guess You're grumpy. This I morning. am grumpy. Well, I, I work in the business. I know what, uh, how this is done, and I've seen it done in communities all over the country, and I saw it done in, outside of Texas and Atlanta, 400 right. North, and I saw it done outside of... Uh, those are projects that I worked on 20 years ago, and it's decimated communities. We've got we've to wind this up, gentlemen. We really appreciate you all taking the time to be out here. At, uh, this understanding that we get from these conversations is, is invaluable. And we really appreciate your uh, joining us. Uh, lots more to cover. Hope you'll all be back next month. There's tons of other bills like uh, the uh, uh, Medicaid block grant uh, efforts going on, the uh, abortion efforts going on, lots of things that uh, our viewers probably would like to hear your co uh, comments on. So we look forward to being back next month on the last Friday of the month. Uh, lots of people to thank for making this happen every morning. Uh, Dr. Janet Smith and Dr. Darrell Lampley in uh, Columbia State, we uh, really appreciate this uh, beautiful place that you let us have this and uh, all that you do for the community in addition to that. Our corporate sponsors, uh, Vanderbilt, 
uh, with Lynn Maddox and uh, Dennis Wagner with AT&T and uh, a little company called Aspen Grove Asset Management that uh, puts it on the radio. Uh, Creed Henderson and the TV crew from WCTV, we, uh, they make us look a lot better than we deserve every month and we appreciate that. Tom Lawrence and WAKM gets us on the air there. And uh, the chamber staff led by Kel, um, and he's pointing to the coffee. Uh, the community coffee people are an uh, invaluable part of this whole process, or we would not be able to uh, keep our eyes open here every morning. So uh, the community coffee people, we are so thankful for that. And uh, there was somebody else. Uh, hey, thank you, Don. Uh, Don uh, provided uh, pastries this morning. We appreciate that. The, uh, uh, but the chamber staff, uh, personal uh, thanks to Nancy Conway for giving me this job many years ago. And uh, we have a lot of fun with it. I learn a lot every month and just appreciate the opportunity to do this. So uh, any comments or questions, please let us know. And uh, we look forward to seeing you back next month. Thank you very much.